Hey there, welcome to One Take, powered by backers. No, 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 no judging. Yeah. No judging. The millennials are really changing that. That is charm. No. <laughs> All success begins with desire. I feel like I'm on fire right now. OMG, baby. Hey there, welcome to One Take, powered by backers. I'm Justin Fox. I am joined here by Hassan uh, Padawala. Ha Hassan, thank you very much for joining me on the show today. Thank you, Justin. Appreciate the invite and meeting up as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. And and we were just sort of talking off air. You saw some of the content from the Startup uh, Startup Canada tour yesterday. So I'm glad you're sort of following along and, and definitely a follow your content as well, but let's let I'll do a quick quick intro here so we the people know who you are and what uh, what we're going to talk a little bit about. So uh, you're the person you want to you're that person. Um, actually, I was reading it. You're different, but when I'm reading this by here, uh, the person <laughs> you walked by your it. side uh, when tackling impossible challenges uh, over the last twenty years, uh, you've successfully managed businesses and projects in talent management, supply chain management, new technology deployments, organizational culture deployments or development story, um, and business scaling up across several continents for a Fortune 500 company, along with multiple other companies in the energy, clean tech, agri-tech, and sustainability industries. Uh, currently, you're a fractional C COO sorry, at Parta Sense Solutions, co-piloting uh, entrepreneurial businesses in scaling up and commercialization. Uh, you serve as a business advisor for Eaton Log. Uh, mentor, you mentor startups at entrepreneurship at UBC, obviously. Um, is a board member for Vancouver Fringe Festival. Uh, volunteers at several NGOs in the greater Vancouver uh, area. And is also a professor, professor teaching small business management to MBA candidates at UVic, University of Victoria. Um, you also like um, to be known... Sorry. Is that uh, University no? of Canada West? What's it's that? University of Canada West. University of Canada West. Oh, University of Canada West. Sorry. And then yeah. you also like to be known as an aspiring stand up comedian, which is interesting. Can talk a little about that. A M A M I L cyclist. Not sure what that is. Uh, and a podcast host. Uh, would love to do a cross pollination, maybe uh, jump on yours. I know when I was reading through your bio and sort of sent out the, the invite, sort of the co-pilot side, that really was what piqued my interest, right? Obviously that kind of a lot of startup founders. And, and I mean, before I get into welcome to the show, all that, all that, and, and you're here and appreciate you joining me. So uh, welcome to the show. I guess we'll start there. Thank you. Um, I always get shell shocked or oh, going to go like say that's a long intro <laughs> but oh, good. um mammal is middle-aged man okay in lycra in light so, okay so that, in that tight pants that's a spandex, tight, yeah, 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 yeah. spandex yeah. where people are going on the bicycle yeah yeah They're okay going, why would this old dude why is this 20 year old guy All wearing right. Spandex. Spandex. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so it. you're a middle-aged man in Lycra. I, if I wore spandex, I would be a middle-aged man in Lycra as well. I don't quite. I would. I. I'm not against it for sure. I. I definitely be interested in in trying. A, a, we're actually just brought our the kids bikes out from Toronto a couple weeks ago. We did a cross-country road trip. Um, brought a whole bunch of stuff back in our van. Um, including the bike. So we'll be definitely getting out and about in Vancouver uh, on bikes as the weather is obviously nicer now. So um, not sure if have I'm going to get the tight, the spandex on just yet, but yes. If you ever out and you see a guy in a Cookie Monster jersey, okay. this tall brown bearded dude in a Cookie Monster jersey, more than likely it would be me. That's you? Okay, perfect. Well, right. you're you're sort of in the area, like in the vicinity. So we were talking about startup um, Startup Canada tour where I was in Langley last uh, yesterday. Um, I'm I'm in South Vancouver, living so you're in Burnaby, you said, right? Yeah, I'm in Burnaby. Burnaby, That's perfect, right. perfect. So let's let's jump into um, talk a little bit about. I think the co-pilot. You know, for me, that was the first thing uh, that I thought of. You know, was was kind of an interesting um, you know take on what you're you know what you're all up to, what you're sort of about. Why don't you talk a little bit about? the co-pilot aspect Swiss army knife was kind of what I was, you know, when, when I first sort of saw your, um, your bio, you know, you said co-pilot Swiss army knife. Tell us a little bit about that, um, that aspect of you, I guess. Sure. Um, 
I kind of took these two terminologies looking at what the language is nowadays. Mm -hmm. What I've realized is from all the different jobs, roles I've done, like I've been an HR manager, managing people across from Egypt to India. Right. I focus on recruiting people for different business units, mm -hmm. going scaling up and then also readjusting business units that were scaling down and the company. The hard part. And then I <laughs> created supply chain as well, right? Right. And all these things I did at a corporate level, anywhere I went, it always came down to is helping out the leader of that business unit. Right. Helping out someone else. And then when I always looked at it was whenever you see a leader, you see the alpha. Right. But when the shit gets done, when people need to move, you have to have that beta, that COO, that second dude. Yeah, yeah. If you're flying a plane, someone has a heart attack, the first person you're going to go, get me the pilot. That's the yeah. default thing. We've seen that in all the movies now. Yeah. But when that pilot is looking after that person, when it's trying to, when he, she, they are managing all the people in the rest of the plane, mm -hmm. someone still needs to fly the plane. Someone still needs to guide that plane through it. Not losing focus, not forgetting where we're going. And in a business as well, when you have the CEO, they get dragged to a lot of things. They'll yeah. get dragged into fundraising, pulled in everything, every corner, yeah, board, yeah. who yeah. is this investor? And then oftentimes they struggle on operations, they struggle on understanding what do we do? How do we do it? Right. And oftentimes the people around startups, when they come in, they don't have that experience. They don't have the experience. They don't have the know-how on the understanding what to do. Yeah. And this is where I kind of want to come in. Is like I've been so many places, worked in different business units and different cultures. Mm -hmm. I just enjoy doing that doing part, keeping the system, keeping the business moving forward. So for me as a co-pilot is helping out those founders, the CEOs is where do you want to go? It's going to be difficult navigating through everything, but I'm here. Yeah. Like I've gotten through the navigating. I've helped a bunch of people, understanding the empathy, getting the systems in place seeing what that's focused, but also holding the founder, the CEO accountable. And, and that's, the, that's the Swiss army too, where you've got all the tools that you can do multiple things, be that focused and, and that ability as well to kind of, you know, co-pilot. I like the co-pilot idea where, you know, you're, you're basically keeping shit together. If you, you know, for, you know, obviously the, seemingly the CEO, if you will, or the founder or whoever, you know, the leader is often pulled in many directions, but you're able to kind of be there in, in one regard. And, and oftentimes in larger organizations, you'll have sort of that, you know, COO, CFO, you know, you've got your CMO, like those are the co-pilots where they're focused on specific areas, usually of the business, obviously a COO in a much smaller organization probably covers all of those all of those those areas right so it's sort of like all in one all encompassing while the you know the leaders kind of being pulled in many directions so it's interesting um so you mentioned fortune 500 companies and, and i you know i've looked at obviously you're with entrepreneurship entrepreneurship at ubc and as well as um you know some of the other areas where you know eaton log and some of the other businesses that uh, and obviously with part of sense um have you worked with sort of the fortune 500 and early stage or where, where do you see your fit being the best suited, I guess? Um, for the first roughly 13 years of my career, I worked for a fortune 500. It was right. an oil and gas company based. Um, it was a global company. I worked in Pakistan. I used to, so here's a quick snapshot of my career in this fortune 500 company. I started off working on the rig site. So I was literally with people, swinging hammers. It was like living in Alberta on an oil rig. That's okay. what I did like my first few years after I did my chemical engineering degree from Minnesota. Then I just had- So that was, that was sl uh, Schlumberger, right? That was Schlumberger, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I started doing field operations and within field operations, they promoted me to, to managing business units. Mm -hmm. um, then it came to like, hey, you're doing good with handling people become marketing manager, go sell all this new technology. This okay. is like all this stuff in the oil and gas, go do this, it's your playground, just go make money. Yeah. All right, I'm successful enough to do that. Then I got moved to HR, say, 
hey, there's all these disgruntled people. Um, make you're good, you're good with people. Why don't you go? You understand Perfect. them. Like, you know them. Why don't you go talk to them? Yeah, yeah. You sold all of these things, right? You got all these contracts in place. You built up. You got everything good to go. Now solve these people problem. Right. And then they say, okay, fine. You did this. You're good on this. Um, you want to set up a regional distribution center in the Bay. Right. So like 5,000 SKUs. It's across the globe again. We need someone to do the change management, put the systems in place, fix the stock, fix the supply chain. Right. Here you go. So like, you were okay, like a hired gun that. wherever they needed sort of somebody to come there. in. And, yeah, 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 yeah. The yeah. strategy was there. Let's bring him in. He understands it. Because anything you solve a problem is you got to understand the stakeholders. You got to understand what really is the driver. Right. Understand the strategy and then get everyone to execute. Mm -hmm. But the communication between different cultures, genders on the form, because all the work I did in 2011, 2012, 14 was always on the phone. Okay. Was on the screen. So before the pandemic, I was used to doing conference calls. I was used to just picking up talking to people in China and creating this online relationship with them. Right. And delivering results, gaining systems in place, transferring that out. And then it kind of just kept going in. So then I ended up in Vancouver roughly four years ago. So okay. I did work with Cambridge. I left, I left when I was an operations manager, I was handling two countries. It was a revenue of roughly 30 million a year, 200 plus people. Okay. When you work in oil and gas, we all know the story. It's not the best. It's not the best for the environment, not the best long term. Right. And I just wanted to go do something which made me happy, which brought me that joy. Because when I was doing chemical engineering, I focused on biodiesel. I made a bioreactor when I was in university. So right. all the sustainability, new technology things. And why not come to Vancouver, which was supposed to be the clean tech capital of the world? Four okay. five years ago, yeah, all these new things coming out. There's so many different companies, so much happening. Right, that's just Vancouver. Yeah, it's a very forward, trees. forward thinking sort of. Yeah, West Coast, um, definitely. Yeah, e energy conscious. Um, you know, sort of environmentally conscious kind of environment for sure. So I came here kind of looking at helping the small businesses scale up because what I realized as well. There are a lot of good founders. Everyone has an idea. Everyone knows what they kind of want to do. It like, let me rephrase that. Everyone knows they want to do something. Right. They, don't they just don't know how to do how it. How to do it? Yeah. yeah. I, I actually and then just they go it. around finding people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've gone through a point where I've been fortunate enough that I've met a lot of people who have guided me, mentored me at different stages of my career. Right. And for me now, is the reason why I was successful is there were people that I supported, and people that supported me, and we worked as a team. Right, sort of a yeah, cross is cross pollination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now sure. I kind of want to do that same thing with small to medium sized businesses coming in. Is people have been here for like ten years. You got like family businesses that have been around for like twenty five years. Right. But now they don't know what to do because within Vancouver, it's a certain geographic. It's like a bubble. People don't tend to go out. They tend to go down to the U.S. But right. then laying down the processes, creating the organizational culture. Finding people who are happy to be working for them, right? right? And then making sure, like, how do you get the product market fit and how do you scale up so that way you're successful? And I feel like every small business owner has a lot on their plate and they can't hire every single person. Yeah. They need someone who has that kind of holistic view. It's smart enough to know, like, this is what you we should be doing. Here's some good metrics to follow. You're a good principal. I did the MBA. I've been around people. It's a melting pot. Right. But then also smart enough to know is let's get someone now who can run this. We've got the bare bones, we've got the framework. Now we can now that business can afford that three hundred thousand dollar person to come and run it. Because anytime you want to fix it up, you want to spend up easily 150k plus to get this right. one person. On the right person. So it's interesting. So just to clarify, so if you're you're looking at what what size of business would you typically be dealing with? And it sounds from what you're describing, you're looking at almost a transition from the the original founder, let's say, or the the original founder team into more of a you know traditional CEO, even sort of president type role that that's being brought in 
after the fact? Is that kind of how you're describing it? Or, or are you saying just in general, in certain areas, like whether it's the CFO, CMO, you're also bringing in somebody externally to kind of uh, take over and manage and run a, a certain aspect of the business. I, I guess kind of clarify where, how oh, you, yeah, no, how I, do that. No, I, yeah, I yeah. see where you're going from. Right? Yeah, yeah. The first one is I usually work with startups that are going to a series A or a series B. Series meaning a, series B. they okay, have a product yeah. market fit. Yeah, yeah. So like 10, 20, 30 million kind of in, in valuation yeah. or, or bigger. Or bigger, right? They got yeah. the product market fit. They know how to, they've got everything now. Now right, they right. got to go sell it and scale up. Right, right. Okay. Because yeah. getting the product market fit, I'm saying the market is good, but that scaling up. That next step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The next step is always where you see companies struggle. Of course, yeah. Because then you got to make sure people are getting hired, the right people are getting hired for the right rates. Do you yeah. have the right onboarding system? Do you have the process to measure the key metrics? Yeah, yeah, yeah. KPIs and stuff. success, KPIs. Yeah, exactly. How are you going to bring the people on? What are the training developers plan? Mm -hmm. Well, it's what new technologies do you add in which doesn't become cumbersome to the entire process? And are you growing that network of supply chain? Yeah, so it's I mean that's that's definitely the the scale up aspect, right? And it's it's I mean a lot of businesses. Oh, I, I use the word a lot, but not a lot of businesses get each step, right? Like there's obviously a weeding out process, right? So yep. if you get to that step, yeah, it's difficult. Every step has its own unique challenges, right? As they kind of go through the process. Um, so if you look at a statistic, yeah, when you start a small business, anyone who starts a business. Roughly the first three years, the numbers were around 67% to 70% of the business goes under. Goes under in the first three years, right? yeah. So then you have roughly 30% of the 30% business left. Yeah. And the next two to three years, out of that 30%, only 33 survive again. Right, right. So again, another 60, 70% fail. So you're at, yeah, you're at you know, 30% of, of 30%. So I, I use the stat, arguably 90% of businesses fail kind of in that first yep. five to seven years, right? That's kind of the equivalent sort of math there, right? Yeah. And then what I'm trying to do is I'm just tell those businesses keep growing or sustaining. Right. Not every business is going to be a hundred million dollar business. Right, right. They but might plateau you, at a certain level. Yeah. And then there's all businesses that family owned businesses come in Someone comes in with this really good idea, wants to make enough cash for themselves, a couple of friends, right, and have a decent life, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. And that that's perfectly okay, right? And that's where I kind of really thrive in meeting new people from different backgrounds, mm -hmm. helping them get to the point where they survive after five to ten years. They're right. able to be agile enough to keep growing, get to a point like maybe let's say 400, 500 employees, making let's say a year, monthly revenue of maybe five million. Okay. Six million monthly revenue. So like ARR right. of like 60 million kind of thing. 60 million. Yeah, yeah. 60 million. And then that's a really good point to scale up, to invest. Because every big company I've seen, even with Apple, even with Microsoft, like Apple went bankrupt in the mid 90s. Yeah. Right. Like I think people, people don't realize that. that. That's sort of when, and Steve Jobs was kind of pushed out and a lot of different things yeah. happened. Right. Yeah. And all the time, every single time I see someone else, they're seeing businesses that are successful, but not understanding they went through years of pain. Even right. Tesla right now, Tesla has been around for quite some time. Yeah. I remember the biggest thing in Tesla was 2013, they never could produce those many cars. Yeah, There's the scalability, no production. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And not until they went to China, found manufacturers, found the people there, were they starting to produce and deliver cars in a timely manner. That took them six to seven years. It's it's interesting you just to touch on that point there because there was always and 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 you probably know a little better than this than I do, but there was always the speculation that obviously Tesla was you know breaking new ground, right? It was sort of they were they were the guinea pig, the sort of test test rabbit, whatever you want to call it. They were the ones going to market, but the the concept was that it wasn't scalable unless another larger manufacturer that had the distribution had the manufacturing capabilities stepped in right but as you're saying tesla was able to overcome that over a period of time um but now you see like i just saw one for i think volvo or volkswagen has one i mean they're all now coming out with their own version right all the the major car manufacturers so oh, is is it's coming uh, out 
right? I mean, that's kind of, so what are your thoughts like in that, that theory? And I know we'll kind of just sidetracked a little bit, yeah, but no what, what, what are your thoughts as far as like Tesla being the, the arguably the guinea pig, the test, the test subject, and now everyone else coming, do you think Tesla will be able to maintain and grow or where are your thoughts kind of on that area? If we kind of look at a business perspective, scaling up perspective. On the business perspective of scaling up, Tesla did a lot of things right, which was generate yeah. awareness of EVs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring that new market into play. Yeah. They figured out production. They were able to get the right people to help them start manufacturing efficiently. Right. Right. Yeah. They got people in. There was and the, and they just dropped their prices million. too, like 20, 30 grand, right? In the newest, yep. the Y, right? The Model Y. And then when you go and review documentation and papers, oftentimes the first mover just changes the market. Right. The second, the third, the fourth are the ones that actually benefit more. Yeah. Are the ones that can scale up, are the ones that grow. So this is going to be a thing with Tesla, I feel, is they guess they got the first mover, EVs came out, Rivian came out, Tesla, like all these other guys kept coming out. And now the bigger guys are coming in as well because government is pushing them to do it. Yeah. I, and I, that's the thing with the first mover is like the first mover is good, but then how how well can you keep your blue ocean right strategy? Because like blue ocean, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where you know the there's, ocean is literally now blood in the water. The yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that the I mean, there's there's the whole change. exactly there's the whole thing. Uh, pioneers get slaughtered, settlers flourish, right? So Tesla was kind of that pioneer breaking the new ground now the the bigger players if you will are going to come in and settle um will tesla be able to adapt and kind of um now i I would say though and this is where i think tesla and, and we're talking about one example might be a a large enough player in the game already and established enough that they will be able to sustain that kind of you know where they are that that first mover i think you know, they could be in theory considered first, second, and third mover. I mean, they've they've been at oh, it Tesla's for not yeah. going anywhere right now. Tesla, yeah, yeah. the thing with Tesla now is the valuation. Right. The stock market is there. Well, they've we, people won't let Tesla fail. Let's be honest yeah. on that one. You right? think they're now too big to fail? They're on the other side, sort of of it everyone's like, bought you look in. At certain things, like it is so big that if you get to the point, how many people are invested in the stock market right. that would Jump off a building if yeah, that stock well, went down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I go, it's just going to be a valuation change. Like it might happen when that's the thing when the CEO moves on, when the next person comes into play. Because if you go over the pioneer settlers, when we look at San Francisco, Silicon Valley, the reason why we have Silicon Valley there, why we have San Francisco, is a bunch of people from the East Coast of the United States of America at that time yeah. were sent to the West Coast to go find gold. Right. Then right. they've got phone, they found gold, the side building, and then they wanted to make farms. So yeah. John Deere, the government, put all this money into the West Coast, had that develop into a place where machinery started coming out, farmlands were growing up, all this gold thing came in. And then all these people who moved slowly grew up there. And yeah, that's yeah. how we got to San Francisco. Right, right. I, it's like, interesting. I've, I've never, I mean, okay. I've, I've sort of understand the West being, you know, where the, where the settlers went kind of thing or the, you know, pioneers went initially. Right. Yeah. And that's what you said. The settlers are still stuck around. The pioneers yeah. paved the way. Yeah. The settlers came in and you can look at the settlers, the tech stock, all right. the tech people who moved in, in the 60s and 70s, because San Francisco, California was that hub for innovation because the government was putting money in there. Mm -hmm. They were asking for the innovations to happen. Mm -hmm. World War II had ended. They needed new things. The races came up for the space race. New technologies are popping up. It became that hub of innovation. Right. And I feel Vancouver can be the same hub of innovation. And it's always supported by federal and universities. So when I work with the universities, it's always seeing these new ideas. What's happening? Right, cutting right. edge Everyone for sure. Cutting edge. Everyone has batteries. There's so many different types of batteries out there. Yeah. But the amount of money that needs to get tested, right? The amount of frustration a founder feels when they don't know how to go find someone to get something done. And that's the coming of the co pilot comes in, right? Like if you know these people are here, and there's a lot of good people within Vancouver. 
Yeah. It is that do they start their own business or do they keep helping the community grow? So even when you went to startup Langley yesterday, yeah, my LinkedIn was flooded because there were several companies that I had helped that you're connected growing. to. Yeah. Connecting yeah. to see their talk yeah. to the founders were pitching and presenting at Langley. Right. Okay, cool. Even people that you ran into, it was like, oh, I know that face. Yeah, okay. There you go. The circle is so small. The network is here. Right, right. But then helping those founders, helping them understand to raise money, you need the product market fit. To raise money, you need to develop yourself. Yeah. And so, I go on the Cisco story because like when I was gonna say bigger. let's yeah, I was I was gonna ask sort of tell us a little bit about your thoughts with entrepreneurship. But yeah, I'd love to hear what's the Cisco story. So Cisco was the routers they were made. I thought you were going to go the thong song. Man. No, just kidding. No, the thong yeah. song. Not the thong yeah, yeah. Song. No. <laughs> I'm joking. A different joking. Story, but yeah, different just, Cisco. Uh, no, no, no. I, I realized that. Different Cisco. Was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thong yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways. But it was just like a husband and wife. They got money in. Right. They ran the business. At one point, both of them got kicked out. Okay. They stuck around too long. First, the husband went, then the wife went. Few this is Cisco, the, the chip uh, manufacturer? Um, The router, yeah. Uh, uh, the router, router. Yeah, the routers. They get like everywhere you go. The wireless services. This goes started by yeah, yeah, yeah. a husband and a wife. Okay, and uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know they come in, Okay, and then they get pushed out because, like, at one point, founders do become kind of the obstacle because they're so focused on the vision, the bigger picture, but that commercialization, getting to market, is a challenge. And that's always the constant thing is when you scale up, how does entrepreneurship look like? Because the one common thing I realized when I talk to anyone within Vancouver is it's hard to scale up in Vancouver in BC. Manufacturing is almost zero. Then anything which is tech is great. SaaS right. is good. Right. Otherwise, if it's not SaaS, the safest way to put money into real estate. Yeah. So well, in, in is this entire estate, yeah. concept, we don't want to take a risk. We don't want to challenge ourselves. But the reason why all these other innovation hubs, like in America, like in Asia, in the Middle East, anywhere you go, people will take the risk. They'll put the money in on an untested idea. They do the diversification of funds. Here, no one wants to take that risk on manufacturing. There's so many companies in green tech, in clean tech right now, that need hundred to $300,000 to set up a facility to make a product which people can use. But funding gets more available is to those SaaS companies that have a quicker payout time. So, okay, you kind of just answered, I was gonna ask, why do you think that is? You mentioned the quicker payout, but aside from, I mean, yeah. why is it a quicker payout? Like, I, I mean, it's return on capital, just tie, like, I mean, I get, I get. Um, so the quicker payout, when you look at it, when you're looking at a manufacturing thing, it is really yeah. project-based. Yeah, yeah, that is easily to set up a plant to build something. Yeah, to You're take like, you six months, seven okay. months. Okay, right, right. Is that find the vendor, fix this up, make sure it's all good, have your contingency plans. What is that timeline going to look like? Because right. to make a facility from scratch, get everything ready, get the parts in, get your first working prototype out for proof of concept, could take anywhere from six months to two years. Yeah, so it's very capital intensive, and there's it is that, capital intensive. that period of time that that it's, yeah. So yeah, delay to return on capital of at least return. six to six to twelve six to twelve months, or as you said, twenty four months potentially, right? Two years. And with SaaS, you can roll out new products every three weeks. Yeah, have it tested in the next three months. Yeah, fix and it, iterate, and big it is iterate. Yeah, and all you need is people. Right. People are the core thing. So you will pay $300,000 for that software developer to fill out the program because then you can see the revenue kick in straight away with subscription, right? Because it's accessible to everyone. Right. You don't have that return. And then when you see that price going up high, then they'll move to an IPO. Then they'll get to a series C, series D. So it and then is... the money comes back out. Okay, so let, let, let's ask this. Yeah. I, uh, this might be a little, I don't know, whoever's oh, watching. I, like I, I want to I wanna, I wanna understand, because this is interesting, actually. I, I'm i new to Vancouver myself, from Toronto, moved here about two years ago. Um, love it. Don't, anyone watching, I love Toronto, love Vancouver. 
The family loves Vancouver, so that's kind of why we're here. From a business perspective, though, I, it, I've always wondered, like, what is the sort of the, I mean, obviously the, the population density is smaller, so there's not as much happening, but there's still, you know, it's a, it's a major city, right? Um, but it always seems like there are certain sort of like, I don't know, um, a reluctance maybe for people to, to jump into certain things, right? I, if that's, yeah. is that a nice way of putting it? I don't know how to put it any, oh, any I'll nicer. Exactly how to put it. Yeah. I moved to Canada roughly six years ago. Okay. Right? And I moved to Canada because I said I'll get an MBA. I was doing business as always that hands-on work. What I realized is here when people come in, no one really wants to go swing a hammer, wants to go work with the hand. Right. Well, I that's did a Canada in yesterday. general, not just Vancouver. Well, thing, I, yeah, did yeah. Class, I did yeah. a class yesterday where we were talking about buying a franchise. Right, so right. An MBA student saying, go figure out to buy a franchise. Yeah. They look around, out of the seven groups that I had made, Three of them chose to do fresh slice pizza. Okay, yeah, yeah. And I was like, great, fresh slice. Why? It's a low meat, it's a low barrier of entry, right? We can get in easily. Right. We get the products, there's zero royalties. So like within like sixty thousand to seventy five thousand dollars, they're saying they could get a franchise and fresh fresh slice. Right. Great. Yeah, yeah. Then my question was is will you work in it? Yeah, who's going to be doing the actual who's like going to be cooking, cooking and kneading the dough and whatever? Yeah, 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 yeah. And they were like, oh, we'll hire someone. Right. I was like... Probably not for the people... first few months, right? Or at least until well, you get up off the ground kind of thing. We have minimum wage. That's the reason why minimum wage is there because franchises can't pay that much. Right. If you want to own a franchise, but then you don't want to work in that business, but you have someone else come in work for you, you're literally giving away your profit. Right. Or a large chunk of it, for sure. A lot stronger. Like, if you had, like, yeah. four or five franchises, yeah. that's yeah, a different yeah, story. Yeah. But if it's going to be your sole business, yeah. you can't just get everyone in. And well, when but... I see a lot of small businesses, they're being like, hey, I don't want to do this. Let's hire someone. Let's hire someone. But then that someone will work for a specific task yeah. because they don't understand the bigger task. Yeah. And then you got this person who came in to solve one problem, works now for the last five years, and the problem has been solved. And the person is there. Right. What is the new challenge? Like, how do you figure that out? So is that concept is when you want to do tech, it's easy down computer, email. That's the thing with the new technology. That's the thing with the new businesses, the social right. media. So right? how do you get that in? Right. But then for me, and this is just purely me, my beliefs, right? When I look at all the things we have, we need power from somewhere. We need someone to pave this road. We need the houses to go up. We need all these things to happen, which are actually kind of by hand, something to manufacture things. But that seems demeaning. We think like, hey, let's get technology. And all those people out there will make it more efficient by giving them all this technology to utilize. There is a statistic done that companies on average have 100 apps. That, their they're, that they're using within their That business. they're using any different yeah, yeah. point, like 100 apps yeah. using to make the companies of Make the companies to supposedly make it more efficient, efficient or, or optimize processes like, or systemize or whatever. Yeah, yeah, everything. And then, like, our people will be at 98% utilization. And for me, having a human and 98% utilization is ridiculous because we all screw up. Yeah. Getting 85% utilization. I was going to say 70 to 80 is probably good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 85 should be the target. Mm -hmm. yeah, 97 yeah. is you're asking for something to go wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, so uh, that's why I kind of look at it. What, how do people want to really do it? And I enjoy living and playing on these lands. Yeah. Like I am on the Musqueam, Silvertooth, and Squamish Nation land. Right. I'm honored to be here. I came as an uninvited guest. But when I come out and I see people kind of being the attractive nature, like, hey, go work a little hard. Get your fingers dirty. Yeah, you get your hands dirty for sure. Yeah. And I think that's the thing is like, how do we get that quick up level up when the so many people coming in, immigrating in, who want the same life as everyone else. But no one wants to get their hands dirty. And this is why I like those capital intensive projects. This is why I like those founders who are willing to do the things themselves because I'm willing to do the things myself as well. Do the dirty work, basically, if you will. You go to right? do the dirty yeah. work. You can't keep yeah. hiring people because that's how you run out of money. So you, you touched on a couple of good things. I I, I, I want to ask a couple of things. One, just out of curiosity, what were the financials of a $70,000 investment 
in in fresh lace did they did they present just those watching because it's interesting that's a yeah. franchise people in vancouver for those in the rest of canada it's arguably like a pizza pizza essentially right yeah. the equivalent and, they, and actually pizza pizza is out here as well but they're they're new but it's sort of that local kind of you get a slice of pizza yeah. it's walk in walk out get a pop and a pizza it's not really your pizza hut where it's like order you know full pizzas it's slices right buy the slice essentially um yeah what 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 was the just quick quick maybe the financials around a franchise did, oh, did the they get into the is, details yeah um uh, so roughly within a hundred thousand dollars you can have your own flesh um fresh slice franchise right they take no royalties okay right? All it is that everything that you get on your products, meaning your pizza dough, yeah, you're buying through them, everything, it goes to them. Right. Okay. They will help you with the global brand branding and all. Yeah. And yeah. Everything aside, you just have to pick it up, invest the money, and start running it. So you have, have to get to your location, location and stuff. You have to find the location, location, right? Yeah. 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 Is that location is where do you get the location? Yeah. Because then Fresh Slice also has to prove that location. Okay. Right. Because you do right. want so to be too close. Yeah, yeah, to the other You don't ones, have yeah. a Starbucks on one block and right across the street there's another Starbucks. Right, yeah. And yeah. on the other side other of the corner of Starbucks. Starbucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And which actually happens in some instances. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, for I sure. It. It's like, that's it. So, so just how do you kind of say it out? But then it's a good business because there are those times where if you're well situated in an office block, yeah, people get a pizza slice. If you're yeah. close to an outlet, like sporting or whatever, life, some sort of, yeah. 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 stadium or something then you yeah. know every weekend when the games are on people are yeah. gonna come out you're gonna get some business yeah yeah for sure and yeah. it's a safe investment because the thing with franchises is you only have a 10 percent chance of failure okay because it's, because so it's a proven happen. model right yeah yeah but yeah. then when you start a new business from scratch it goes to almost 20 percent success rate right we yeah it's... like 10 percent. it's like so low yeah, and that's why you see people going buying franchise or buying another business because the success ratio is higher, but the independence of freedom is not there. Doing our own business, we get the freedom, we get all the profits, but we get all the stress and the risk right. of failure. And we, and this is generally speaking now, people don't like failing. We just taking failure in such a negative tone that we got to tell people it's okay to fail. Yeah. We it's, just assume everyone's successful every time. hundred percent. I actually heard a quote. Um, it's about failure sort of, uh, it said 99% of the time. So actually it says optimists um, are needed to kind of create things, right? Because they, they believe that they can achieve it. And that's the only way things get done. And the comment was like 99% of the time um, they're right, but a hundred percent of the time they're wrong. And the reason is that it's that one time that that you get it right as an optimist right yep. and that's kind of you know and it's sort of this you know if you keep trying you keep failing eventually you will succeed right and yes maybe they're right all along until you do succeed right so um that's kind of how i look at my my journey as an entrepreneur but and many many others as well but yeah so it's, and it's interesting when you you talk about a franchise model you've got an established sort of ecosystem established brand you know, usually the back office and a lot of that stuff is kind of, you know, there for you, kind of ready to, you know, ready to go. Um, you know, it, it's sort of uh, what's what's the term? Um, basically, it's, it's given to you, ready oh, to go, right? It's, All you got to do is exactly, you just got to execute, and basically, it. and run like, it, right? Get in your car and yeah. drive the yeah, car. Yeah, drive get in the it. car and drive, exactly, just right? Just drive, it's, just don't yeah. hit anyone, make yeah. sure you follow it, and yeah. you will get to the destination. You'll get to the, exactly. And, and you know, obviously, they, they probably have some experience, so I would assume so, you know, especially at this point where they're, you know, locations, they figure out where, you know, what traffic, and they've got a lot of the analytics around that. You know, we talked about maybe different, demographics work environment you know workers or you know weekend or whatever that you know those types of um that traffic oh, might a, come from right that's all so even with that traffic just on the traffic i'm sorry like there were this but yeah yeah this is the thing when you start working with startups right so not so eden log is a startup that is focused on foodies on helping people remember okay. the food they eat get, have it stored properly post on instagram also learn about it okay another one of the startups i um have been talking to and I mentor on and off, it's called Avenue Intelligence. And all these guys do is people counting. 
Okay. But using technology. Yeah. So data analytics kind of. Data of, al of yeah. There's something that they have hardware. Yeah. They're, they use to count people walking on the street. Because oh, right yeah. now, to, for people counting, yeah. uh, how many people walk down, let's say, Granville Street? Whatever you had a person given time. sitting on the side with a counter clicking. Oh, really? That's how we count people. We count people anywhere. It's people standing on the corners counting people. For cars, we use all these systems, cameras, little stripes yeah. or whatever on the ground. Yeah, I've yeah. Seen. yeah, yeah. So now this company is developing all these different sensors, right, to properly measure where the people are, the distance taking with the sidewalks. So that way, when companies want to have stores open up, when they want to start planning, right, they need this data. Yeah, yeah. So he's using this data to measure human traffic fall, which is footfall. Yeah. Because phones don't do a really good job. Phones only tell you vicinities, but you need the exact counting of people going down one side of the sidewalk and the right, other right. side to know how big the sidewalk should be. Right. Yeah. So you like urban planning, urban planning kind of thing, right? Yeah. Urban planning. So this goes down to is if you want to franchise any business, which is going to sell to consumers, where do you want that to be? And that's yeah. a technology where it's like, you need those numbers. You yeah, so like GPS isn't to... accurate enough, essentially, right? So you've got it. It isn't. GPS yeah. isn't accurate to know where everyone is at a given point of time. So that's one of the other things. That's how you can figure out the footfall. That for me becomes like, what does infrastructure look like? Uh, another one of the companies I've been talking to is on the wildfire. So now they want to build out sensors and use different unmanned vehicles, unmanned aerial vehicles to start like drones. figuring out drones. I don't... Drones is a good one. I'm just going to use UAV, right? Because they want to use something apart from drones. Okay. But it gets sensors everywhere. And using the data, we can now predict potentially which place could have a fire based on the condition. Have a fire? Have a fire, right? Which, you know, like, you're a like, fire or like a forest fire or like a forest fire? A forest fire. Okay. Forest okay. Fire. okay like wow. Right now, the biggest thing that happen now. So currently right now within BC, yeah, we have at least a hundred forest fires happening right now. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. I just was watching the news. Yeah, on yeah, yeah. there's a hundred fires happening right now. Over winter, there were roughly fifty fires burning consistently throughout the winter. Consistently throughout the winter, there were fifty fires that the BC government knew of. Really? So now we go figure out. Like we know that someone's going to come in, and the only way that people actually figure out if it's a wildfire is by a phone call. If someone sees the fire, then people get notified. So these systems now play like, how do you minimize the damage a wildfire can do? And right. that's when the sensors come in. That's when all these new technologies come in. Yeah. So yeah. Again, like, how can we minimize the damage to people? Now we can make people's lives better. Yeah. And those are kind of the things I look at. So when you're looking at all these different things, I mean, you look at the startup world right now, and this reason why I come to Vancouver is, how, let's make sure life's a better place yeah. for future generations. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of these things are not computers, but they're actually products. Yeah, we need to make better products. We need to make it more sustainable. And even now, there's another company I've been talking to, like helping them sort it out, is making construction material from bio aggregates or bio waste. Because construction takes a long time. Like concrete is one of the most carbon intensive products we have. Right, and it uses so much carbon that there's a company called Upcycling in Calgary that utilizes carbon from the air to the sketcher it. There's carbon cure on the east coast of Canada, which takes out carbon, uses that for its concrete manufacturing. Interesting. I actually, you talked about startup, uh, the Startup Canada event. There was a company called, uh, I believe they're called Urban Jacks. I, I'm going to... Okay. Uh, yeah, they I'm were... Uh, yeah, yeah. They, basically, they're, they're using uh, wood... Let me make sure I get this. Uh, urban urban lumberjacks, yeah. So urban basically, um, I think the company is called. I I think I got it right. Urban lumberjack, yeah. Urban urban jacks, and basically what they do is they take wood, um, from sites, job sites, and they're mm -hmm. able to take that wood and and repurpose it and create you know brand new or not brand new but like um almost like I was thinking almost like you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, hardwood or not hardwood? Um, you get like the, the MDF? What's that? The high density. Yeah, and that's sort of like that. But that's where it's like all pieces. This is this is actually pieces sort of finger jointed together. So it was kind of interesting. And they had they were actually walking around with like 
lumberjack sort of the you know the the plaid shirts and big pieces of lumber but yeah it's interesting but i mean there's definitely a lot of companies out there um that are doing a lot of things i want to ask one last question kind of go back to the other other side because that a lot of stuff you just mentioned is tech and i, I think you hit on something that is almost a canada-wide issue on the, your comment you made earlier vancouver definitely i think it's very prevalent here maybe because of the 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 lack of you know sort of area to grow sort of in the lower mainland um you know i would assume real estate and and facilities would be very costly just in and of themselves forget about putting the equipment and all the stuff in them i would think just costs of of the facilities are are high obviously then you could get into the outskirts you know outside of the city and into the you know the prairies and that's probably why there's opportunity there for those types of um ag tech and and other other businesses oh, ag tech is going to be big right ag tech is getting big in vancouver for sure it's, it's and maybe that's a, a shift so it might my question was kind of back to when we sort of were alluding to types of businesses that are getting funding or types yeah. of businesses that people are starting in bc and you alluded to the fact that not getting your hands dirty right now not doing the the hard jobs maybe is deterring people not getting into maybe manufacturing things of that nature which maybe is being shipped or has in the past been shipped overseas potentially or maybe into other parts of the country i mean i look at ontario you've got toronto didn't do a lot of necessary manufacturing but it was definitely in the outskirts right in the hamiltons the, yeah. the oshawas the you know the the northern, you know, berries, maybe not berries even, but like, you know, so the 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 aurora, if you will, and the out oh, that way. What, yeah. like, what, what, what is the solution? I know we're not going to solve oh, no, the solutions right here, but what are what are your thoughts maybe on on a uh, on on kind of how we can improve? Let's just I'll I'll I'll, I'll ask a more sort of direct question. How can we improve that in Vancouver or lower? the lower mainland in BC here um, so that there is opportunity for investors or investors are potentially looking at those types rather than just tech heavy, but maybe other, other types of industries, um, you know, maybe answer the goal. We'll start with that question and then maybe we can see where that goes. What are your thoughts? How can we maybe encourage investors to invest more? I think just in general, Canadians are very risk adverse um yeah. and so they're not and you look at our american counterparts um you know and, and and you mentioned other countries overseas and whatnot how do we encourage investments in canadian companies actually there's a there's a good question to end on let's let's end on that how do we encourage canadians to invest in canadian businesses regardless of what they are all right um, i just asked a really long yeah, question and I went know. on a, a lot of different like, topics <laughs> so, a, lot a, of a lot of things to think about but so yeah, i will I was on a panel last year. Okay. Um, this was at Abbotsford. Okay. So they kind of have an Abbotsford Tech District where you can see the of Fraser Valley. The thing is, when you look at the Bay, when you look at these big places where all has driven people to, to work for them, right? So you got Texas, there's parts in the Bay where I used to live in, there is even in Karachi, even in India. They make these hubs. They make these hubs. They focus on bringing people to these hubs to build things. Right. Um, there's even one in Edmonton. I can't remember the one in Edmonton as well. It's like a small town. They want to make these business hubs, manufacturing places. Right. Anywhere you go, you got to have all these people grouped in together. In Vancouver, you have industrial centers, which are kind of choked off in different places. There's no easy access to the roads. Right. If you go down here within Burnaby, if you're on South Vancouver, you're right by Fraser um, Fraser River, and you'll see right on the riverside, you'll have a bunch of industries. Yeah. There was a massive lumber industry there. It's kind of scaled down. Yeah. But all the industries have gone. When you go down to Pit Meadows and you go to Crooked Love, these industries are popping up. It has to be a place where if you need to make products, there's a place where you can go where everything is easily available. Towns were easily done. To get right. to Ennis's Island, where a lot of other production facilities are, yeah. a lot of supply and like food production, well, sorry, where food production happens. Yeah. There's no easy way to get there. Like yeah. transport. I see that actually, it's area. funny. I see that name on the highway. I have no clue where it is. Anassas Island. 
it's and somewhere said, on the like highway out towards sort of is um, right before Alex Fraser Bridge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it has so many industries. Like it has a place N Wave, which dehydrates food products. There's another place which makes food products. They have all the other locations that are there, but getting to these facilities are challenging. Right. And most of the facilities, let's say most of the industries that we have within Vancouver or the main, lower mainland is tourism. Well, of course, uh, yeah. Movies, right? The VFX studios, tourism, movies comes in, and then it goes to the cruise ships, right? So a lot of the food aspect. Every single person I want to talk to, let's make this food. Otherwise, because of the vicinity and because of Trump, we are the same time zone as San Francisco and Seattle. So now you got all these other guys trying to work with the big guys in San Fran and Seattle as contractors, a software game. Right. And for me, it's you got to have these places where the technology is there to help innovators, to help entrepreneurs experiment, play around. Right, right. To flourish. And you also got to give them the proper tech incentive. You have to give them like, hey, if you go to manufacture, produce, you can come here, you get the support, you get different tax rates. Right. And government's supposed to define this. That's how Alberta got people in. We're going to give you a different tax rate in this certain area. Not right. overall, but if you put all your facilities in this region, right. so this region grows, then you get the tax rate. And that's what Texas did in Austin. Austin got in. They got the tax cuts because right. then the students come in, the students learn, the students grow. Your talent pool increases. Mm -hmm. Once your talent pool increases, those people most likely won't move around. They'll settle, they'll have kids. And that's how that city will keep going. Sorta, but then yeah. we also need to invest in ourselves. The so people here, because it's so transitional, they don't want to put money into someone they don't know. They don't want to take that risk of losing money. Right. And Canada being so resourced, Focus initially, like it was a fur trade, you know, all the gas, let's do right. all these things on resources. Mm -hmm. They're looking for a safe bet, which is real estate. For them, it's like, well, real estate will always go up. And the real estate market has been ridiculous. The oh, yeah. people coming in, the lack of proper urban planning, yeah, that has driven people to a brink where real estate is a good market, which it shouldn't be. It's like literally, when you die, what's going to happen to your land? Yeah. It goes back to the rest of the world. Right. But when you make something that people consistently use, that's different. And yeah. we don't really reward that here. That's in, I mean, you read a, a bunch of really interesting points there. I mean, I think, and this maybe it's self explanatory too, you know, f if you think about it, the, the, the resources for innovation aren't quite here for certain sectors. In, yeah. in Vancouver specifically, right? And and you kind of alluded to they maybe are in Seattle and San Fran. So people are that maybe have those skill sets are working sort of for those companies there rather than trying I have their own five kind friends. of yeah. So I have five friends who work for companies outside of Vancouver. Right. Because then they have the talent. They there's no infrastructure. More money. Exactly. They're and they're getting paid here and they're like, hey, if I gave you more money. Why work here? And there's no incentive. Like you said, there's no incentive for them to try or even the infrastructure for them to even to try to do something on their own, right? And that's, yeah. yeah. So there's like a lack of incentive, lack of kind of infrastructure, you know, kind of resources. You mentioned Anassas Island, which again, I've, I've driven by, I've seen the name, I've never been, but I assumed it was some sort of industrial type kind of commercial um, kind of grouping of of i never knew what industry you're saying food and and that kind oh, of there's industry. A lot. It's like production it's all spread yeah. over because yeah. then you get to delta and surrey that's on river road okay there's all these companies and they're making new new facilities right but you need to incentivize them either through tax break right right, right. i just saying like hey if investors put money in you get benefits no right, investor right. is going to put money in if they can't get some return, if they can't be guaranteed return, guaranteed that's some return, right? Yeah. That's the thing with sure. Canadians. Like, we need things to be guaranteed. Where's the, why is it always a back. guarantee, right? Isn't high risk, high reward? Isn't that the whole point of that's investments? That's the whole point. And that's yeah. the thing with entrepreneurs. It's like, no, we want a guarantee return, but yeah. they're more than happy to invest $100 million. Yeah. It's a proven technology. Well, and this, I mean, this is so coming from our 
side of it. I mean, we work with a lot of really early stages. Like you're talking pre, you know, you were saying series mm-hmm. A, series B. We're talking like pre, pre C, like not even incorporated, maybe just trying to figure oh, yeah, stuff out, right? Yeah, yeah. And 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 then I mean that, and so there's a lot of sort of um understanding that needs to go into and you talk about the guidance at the very beginning you know they don't know what they don't know and they don't know a lot right and they just maybe know what they know about their product or their idea or their business but the rest of the business they have no real understanding of right and that's kind of where the co-pilot pilot comes in oh yeah often to... late much later maybe too late depending on where it depends right? on yeah, when the person sort of, is out. like yeah, i yeah. my my preference is having a per market fair because then it's just more fun yeah, but then I'm okay to come in at the early stage because if they don't know what they don't know, they end up spending way too much money. Yeah, and there's a lot they of end heavy up lifting. Burning out. Yeah, they burn out the, exactly. The, for me, it's the burnout and the burn rate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one thing the founders understand. Like, if you don't know, that's okay. Yeah, you might have to pay something extra, but then in the greater scheme of things, you make that money back. Yeah, especially and you save your save your sanity a little you bit. You save your sanity, you come back, you know what's it, you become stronger. Yeah. And the other rule of thumb is most entrepreneurs that are successful, the highest majority that entrepreneurs are successful, are the ones in their above 45. Meaning okay. they've done it a couple of times, they already failed it. And because of the failures, because they know what to do, yeah, they're more likely to be successful if they start a business later in their life. Interesting. I just turned 46, so there's hope for me yet. Oh, there's um, hope. They're like Colonel no, Sanders. Yeah, yeah. What's that? Colonel Sanders. If you make a good oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kid, <laughs> you can't make it. Yeah, if you, yeah. Well, I saw, I read a story about him actually, and I think yeah, it was like 86, right? Like out trying to get the, his seven spices or whatever, his, his secret sauce out to the world, right? But yeah, in his yeah. 80s or whatever, something like that. Yeah, crazy. Um, interesting. Well, I appreciate, Hassan, I really appreciate you joining me. On the show today, I know we didn't solve Vancouver's uh, we'll never solve. Ec- economic and investment and and uh, and growth development issues in one conversation. And there's a lot, obviously, that people need to discuss. And I think one of the other things is, yeah, I mean, governments need to and 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 the community, obviously, and the business community need to come together, figure out what it is that ultimately you want, right, from a business. Like you said, it seems like, and that's. The first I've ever actually heard someone say Vancouver is all about tourism. The lower, I mean, obviously you got Whistler, Vancouver, beautiful. You know, you mentioned the cruise, the food. I, you know, I never really thought about it that way. It is very much a tourism first city. You know, the downtown core, the you know, the business core is almost a bit of an afterthought to to some extent, right? I'm not I'm not saying it's completely, oh, yeah, no, like, but if it's you've been here. Yeah. It's your first summer. If it's gonna be your first summer in Vancouver, uh, sec- second full summer, but yeah, second full summer. So yeah. I guarantee you now you'll see parks closed off, certain sections closed off because there'll be some studio making a movie. Well, the other side, yeah, yeah, the movie that side, yeah, yeah, side, yeah. and then yeah. you're just gonna have people doing adventure sports. You'll have people in yoga pants, like I'll be on cycle. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I think yeah, yeah. it's a place of activity. Go. Enjoy the outdoors, see the uh, world, get some fresh air. It is. So it, it is. And there, that's actually another point. Everyone's outside enjoying life. And it's sort of a different lifestyle, right? You look at this sort of, I mean, I'm not going to knock Toronto. I love Toronto, but it is arguably a concrete jungle. There's not, I mean, you have to drive an hour to really get anywhere. I mean, there's, my wife and I joke, they Parkette is like this little triangle on the side of, you know, you know, between like two streets, it's got one park bench and a tree <laughs> and that's a parkette, right? Like sort of laughable at, to some extent, but Vancouver on the other side is like just expansive, like everywhere is green. You can go, you know, within 20 minutes, you're in the mountains kind of thing, right? You're at, yeah. you're at the ocean, you're, you know, um, so there's a lot of outdoor activities to enjoy. So it makes life here more livable if you will but from a business perspective maybe it, it does it isn't as um which is good i again i'm not saying one's better than the other oh it's, like it's you just you know what's better it's we just, only know it, in hindsight yeah it, it's just it is what it is right it's just what you prefer so um cool well i guess that's all where can they find you where where are you at i mean obviously you, you mentioned your your um uh, teaching um, at a couple different places yeah volunteering oh, yeah. mentor yeah what so for me if anyone wants to find me on my linkedin page i'm hassan at hassan Pardawala, or go to Pardawala Sen solutions 
Okay. Um, I'm always happy to have a chat. Like if anyone's just curious, like you and me, I'm always open to meet new people because you never know where we go. You yeah, know yeah. what happens. I'm always up to help people out in any capacity as possible. They can reach out to me on my LinkedIn page, drop me a message. I'm on Instagram with the same handle, Pardha Sense. If anyone wants to go on a bike ride, drop <laughs> me a note. I'm always happy to go down gravel biking. Otherwise, always a coffee and go for a walk. It's always yeah. fun meeting people in different places. Yeah. Well, let's, I mean, we should definitely go grab a coffee as well sometime and, and uh, sort of catch up and talk about some other stuff off air, not, not, uh, like this, but uh, yeah, great, great having you on. Um, really appreciate it. The insight, a um, little bit different perspective because yeah, you've you've got the business side of Vancouver. You know, I've spoken to a lot of people on the Toronto side. This is this is a new perspective, so it's good good to understand. So really appreciate it. So no, thank you for having me on the show, though. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. So everyone else, uh, this is one take powered by backers Justin Fox, Hassan Pardwala. Um, at part of part of sense check them out on on linkedin part of sense solutions um and i guess at a at a college or university near you it seems like you're at a couple of different places so yeah i'll uh, be someplace near you someplace near you exactly exactly awesome cool cheers and i will hey there welcome to one take powered by backers right? no 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 judging yeah. No and the millennials are really changing that. That is charm. No. <laughs> All success begins with desire. I feel like I'm on fire right now. OMG, baby, it's